Hey Bike Rumor, my name is Will. I'm the sales manager here at Allied. I want to show you around. I want to show you what we do. Uh, we make bikes from tip to tail right here in Bentonville, Arkansas, the heart of all things cycling. And it's pretty exciting. Uh, we're one of the few remaining people that do it. We're pretty proud of it. And let me show you how we start. So this is our factory and our showroom. It's not much of a showroom, but we do have a demo fleet of bikes here. We do our customer drop-offs here. Try to make it as you know inviting as we can but at the end of the day we are a factory and we are making bikes as fast as we can so we're going to start with the process we're going to start with the raw product it is carbon we are going to go from the process that we take the carbon and we cut it into a bunch of tiny little pieces and we're going to end with watching all those tiny pieces be made into a bike and that bike's going to go into a box and it's going to get shipped to somebody. So we're going to start in what we call the cutting room and that's where we take the raw carbon and we make it into a bunch of tiny little pieces that we're going to lay up. The table is running. So what you see being done here is unidirectional pre-preg carbon fiber from Mitsubishi based in California is being cut into a bunch of tiny pieces. And I'm going to try to get it right. Savannah always corrects me, but it looks like we are doing head tube pieces for a Alpha road bike, right? Yeah, from Triangle. Yes. Okay, so all of these pieces are just for the front triangle of an Alpha, which is our road bike. You're going to see letters, numbers, pieces that look the same, pieces that look different. They're all at different angles on the carbon fiber. That is all by design. We call that the layup schedule. The layup schedule is how all of those little pieces are going to stack on top of each other to give you things like stiffness and compliance and the ride feel and the balance that you like. That is all predetermined by uh, our product development team and our layup team. And we tell the computer software, which I'll show you over here, what size we want, what shape we want, and that software then nests everything together to eliminate as much scrap and waste as possible. And then it talks to this cutting table, and this cutting table is what ultimately is going to cut all of the pieces. Um, Savannah and the team here, they, they pre-stack and pre-kit a lot of these pieces together, so when it travels across the hall to the layup room, it makes a lot more sense as far as uh, uh, where they're going to go and how they're going to get laid up. But essentially what we do is we lay up carbon fiber. So I have an example to show you here uh, just to really simplify this process. So you'll probably be able to see when the light hits it that the fibers of this particular piece are going in, in uh, all the same direction. And this is how easy it is to tear this carbon, right? This is what we make all your bikes out of. Pretty, pretty wild. But when you get very similarly shaped pieces and you start laying those pieces up together at different angles, and this is an old stale piece of carbon, but this is the one I use. So as you do that, it starts to take on a lot more strength properties, right? And so that's where all of the all of the, the characteristics that you would otherwise recognize in bikes as far as the feel, balance, stiffness, that's what goes into here. And so we can change it at any moment if we want to, but this is how we do the production process and this is also how we do a lot of the prototyping process. What we're doing in here is we are laying up all of the pieces that you just saw being cut into a part. Those parts uh, are going to end up in what I call their final resting place, which is the CNC aluminum chunks of metal at the end of the table right over here. Uh, these are called molds or tools, whatever you want to call them. But they are CNC pieces of aluminum that we make ourselves in our CNC machines, and they ultimately will get put into a carbon press. That carbon press will apply heat and air pressure and physical pressure and it's going to take all of the resin that is in these single pieces of, of unidirectional carbon and essentially get it to like glue to itself like a grilled cheese sandwich okay and that's what we're going to do so this mold is almost done uh, they just have to put the, the the final touches on here but in order to get to the final mold there is a large amount of preforming that has to happen. And if we want to just look over here as an example of what preforming means, it's pretty neat. You see these little latex bladders hanging out of the tool. The latex bladders we use for a couple of reasons. Uh, they're really good at preforming because we actually uh, fill them up with, I'll grab it over here and I'll show you. We fill them up with couscous, all right? Seems pretty simple. 
but it's a good effective way to, to give something a nice solid structure. So we put couscous in this latex bladder. We then draw a vacuum line on it and it gives it a nice solid structure. The layup operator then takes the pieces for that part and, and has something nice to kind of wrap around that solid structure and that's called preforming. Once the preforming is done, we'll empty out the couscous back into the jar, but the bladder stays inside of the part. The reason why is when we load it into the tool, we put an airline on it and that airline is used to inject pressure once it's heated up on the carbon press and that ultimately is going to compress all of the individual sheets of carbon together, get rid of any air bubbles, any voids, things like that, and that's going to make a nice uniform part. Okay, So once we close up that mold, there are two little fast food windows over here that we zip them out to the manufacturing floor and then they get queued up to be put on the carbon press and that is where we're going to go next. There are a lot of different stations in here. Each station is doing something different. Um, when we train operators, they get trained in a specific part and they become really proficient at that part before we train them on something else because it is a really long process to get them up to speed to make one of these parts. It's upwards of 60 days to get somebody trained on the part, which requires you know pulling somebody in order to train the new person. And so everybody you see here have been doing these parts uh, for a really long time and they're all pros at it. All of these parts are for BC-40s. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is these latex bladders can't get to all of the really tough nooks and crannies, especially on a BC-40, things like shock mounts, things like main pivots, things like water bottle bosses that we have to co-mold in there. And so there are sub-assemblies, which if you want a simplified explanation for it, would be more like a Russian nesting doll type of assembly that also has to be inserted into the main mold. And all of those pieces have to be done and assembled uh, in the final mold prior to closing it up and putting it on the carbon presses. So it is a lot more than just using these latex bladders. There's a, a lot of other type of sub-assemblies that go into the main tool. That's how we do it. All right, out the door we go. Watch your step. Okay. So once we load a mold, and we zip it out of the fast food window. I like to use food analogies. I don't know why. It's close to lunchtime, so that makes sense. So these three machines right here are what we call carbon presses. Carbon presses are, again, with a food analogy, a, a industrial version of what I would consider to be a panini press. The top plate and the bottom plate are heated um, to a, over a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit. It clamps down on the tool with several tons of pressure, and we inject over 100 PSI of air pressure into that latex bladder. And so what that heat does is it breaks down all the resins and the stuff that we call prepreg in the unidirectional carbon and gets it really nice and, I don't want to say liquid, but very malleable. And then the air pressure gets it to take the shape that it needs to, and the physical pressure just ensures that the system is closed. And that goes, you know, for an hour or so, depending on the part, and when it comes out, it has to be demolded in a very specific way. Uh, we, we, this is a good example of something that came out of the press. You can see that there's still flashing. You can see the parting lines of where the, the tool halves come together. You can see the, you know, the final veil, the OML we call it, the outermost layer of carbon, as well as a lot of other little patchworks of carbon. This is still pretty crude pretty industrial, but this is, you know, the part of a front triangle for a 58 centimeter alpha road bike, all right? Um, there's a lot of work we have to do to get this part ready to actually bond together with all of the other parts. Uh, we put it into a CNC router. We make sure that the areas that get bonded are nice and crisp. We sandblast every part to get rid of all the excess flashing that we, that we can. And then once we do that with this part and all of the other parts that are going to be together with this bike. Then we zip it over to the next series of steps, which is called frame prep and bonding. Um, and that's where we'll go next. But to give you an example of how different each model is, this is how we do a lot of our drop bar stuff. So alphas, echoes, um, ables, they all are made in lots of pieces that we bond together. So there's six pieces of the actual bike along with the fork. So there's seven in total. Uh, with a mountain bike, it's a little bit different. We have 
a rear triangle, which is just two halves, okay? And then we have a front triangle. And the front triangle is a front triangle. This is how it comes out of the mold. Um, so the front triangle is made in one piece. And you know, so it, it's a lot less bonding, but it's a lot of work to get it as a whole coming out of the tool. So you can see, this is where I like to kind of highlight a lot. We don't use just one type of carbon in, in, every, in, in every model, right? So the BC40, we do use a lot of our nice premium high-end carbon, but you'll also see in areas that we have water bottle bosses or areas that we have shock mount hardware or main pivots on the bottom bracket in the main pivot, there's a lot of the little like quilty looking carbon that people know is 3K. Um, while it can be used as a cosmetic carbon, this 3K is pretty strong. It's really good at, at multiple direction stiffness. And so in areas that you have a lot of stress like fork crowns, bottom brackets, shock mounts, uh, water bottle bosses and hydraulic entry and exit ports that have a lot of just a lot of stuff going on to it. We use that 3K and it just strengthens it up. It is heavier, it is a little thicker, so we use it sparingly, but it's required. Okay, so bonding. This is the area of bonding. And the easiest way to start is by way of the bottom bracket sleeve. The bottom bracket sleeve, we use threaded bottom brackets, so it's kind of nice to start here. Uh, it does look different to bond this into a mountain bike versus a drop bar bike but these jigs where Tiffany is at right here on this table, these are where we start the process of bonding. So um, she's gonna start doing a mountain bike right now. This black jig over here is for our drop bar bikes. We basically thread on this bottom bracket sleeve onto the jig. The jig is on a sliding plate. We then put a bunch of epoxy around it. We slide it into the bottom bracket hole of the bike and then we introduce it into an oven so that heat will expand and contract the uh, uh, the epoxy and when it cools down then it's, it's that's the way it is so that's a bonded in sleeve right there if this were a drop bar bike what we do is we use these anvil jigs to finish the assembly process of that bike so we'll just put piece by piece onto that anvil jig and we'll prep each part with epoxy and then we'll essentially jigsaw it together on these jigs right here and those jigs go into a oven again the epoxy gets cured and it expands and then when it comes out and cools down structurally this bike is going to be the way that it is the day that you ride it and for that reason this is our final manufacturing qc process so we do things like mount calipers uh, we pass hydraulic lines and all of that through the frame to make sure no resin dripped inside of it. We make sure everything is symmetrical, make sure that it's aligned, make sure that our seat wedge is going to fit in there. All of the things that otherwise would be a big pain in the butt if we found downstream. So we do that now and when it passes out of here, then it goes on to the next series of steps, which is pretty much cosmetic. Um, and that involves a lot of sanding and prep for paint. So we'll go over there now. So up until a little bit ago, this series of steps was pretty much all manual. So sanding is really important because in order to get a bike ready for paint, we have to make sure that it's really smooth. But carbon fibers as their own are pretty striated and they're pretty rough surfaces with lots of itty bitty little height variances and things like that, especially around the areas that we have bond lines and things like that. So we have to sand the ever-living daylights out of it, but we can't actually sand the carbon because obviously the carbon is really important. So we have to add some sort of media to it in order to build up all those natural imperfections that carbon has to sand them off. And as we sand them off, we sand a lot of that material into the, to the frame to, to make it nice and smooth. And so that's what we do. Um, each one of the sanding steps, there's three of them, it takes anywhere from five to six labor hours to do. So to get a bike ready for paint, there's about 15 to 16 hours of labor in it, which is a lot. So that's why we do a lot of our QC you know, prior to this step, because we don't want to put any more time and labor into a bike if we have to reverse it. So in order to really help this part of the process out, we have uh, invested into a little bit of automation 
this robotic arm is going to uh, do all of the very same things that our, our people do. It's just going to help take this process from a bottleneck into a throughput of the manufacturing process. So this arm is basically mimicking a shoulder, elbow, and wrist, right? So this had to be programmed for all of our forks, for all of our frames, every size of the frame in every model that we have in order to basically get it to locate the bicycle on these sanding drums. Each one of these sanding drums is a different size. That's just because we need to get to different areas of the bike, different nooks and crannies that are at the junctions of the tubes and inside of the fork legs and all that sort of stuff. And in order to do that, Richard, our programmer, had to basically color code each one of these sanding stations and he also had to color code each surface of our forks and bikes to basically correspond to, to where they need to go. We have four units. It's separated and color coded basically. Unit one is a big drum that turns. Unit two is a medium drum that turns with sanding paper grit on it. Unit three is a smaller one diameter to achieve smaller, tighter area. And so the pink is unit three, yellow is unit one, so it's a big surface that is easily accessible. And blue is a medium surface type, so I can go all the way up to here with unit two. And so when this thing runs, it gets, it, it, it does everything our people do. It just does it a little bit faster, and it does it on a program. And we can run that program as many times as we want to. Um, there still is an element of finishing that needs to be done by a human after all this stuff happens, which is great. It just happens a lot faster. Uh, so somebody's painting in there right now, so we won't go into the booth. But this is our booth. It's a downdraft booth. It's really nice. We got it when we moved up here uh, from Little Rock uh, up, to, up to Rogers. Uh, the floor is, you know, the, fil the filtration and the ventilation system, so we can spray a couple things at a time without worrying about cross spray. We do things just slightly different than a lot of other manufacturers. We do not use vinyl decals. We paint on the logo color as well as the body color. So this bike that's being painted right now, it looks like it's gold and gray, but really they just sprayed gold uh, on that bike because it's the logo color. The yellow logos that you saw are actually a paint mask that's applied after the logo color is, is put down. And then they spray the bike whatever the body color will be and then they peel the paint mask off to see your gold logos and then they just finish it off with a gloss clear coat or a matte clear coat and that's how we do it so this one you know yesterday morning it just had neon yellow all over it then we put a paint mask on then we sprayed it with british racing green then we peeled the paint mask off and then it's going to get its it's either matte or gloss clear so it's pretty neat we queue off a, a automotive coats because we use automotive paint so a lot of people kind of wonder how they can get different colors that might be off menu. And if you have any car or automobile that you use as inspiration, let me know. And our computer will more than likely give us the formula for it. And we can, we can mix it because we also have the paints here. So that's really fun. It's kind of become our calling card, actually. So after, after we lay color down, the bikes go into the assembly room, which is kind of the final... Uh, the final stage of paint there is an element of detailing and buffing and things like that that have to be done to a frame to make sure that the clear coat doesn't have any imperfections and things like that and once we clear it out of of that world of paint then it gets staged here in the assembly room and this is where everything kind of ends so this is where we do our final paint and detail and buffing uh, then once it clears out of this area we stage it on the wall for the next days and weeks builds uh, once we get all the parts for it, this is, this is where we build it. You know, we do ship bikes directly to consumers. We ship bikes through retailers, and the packaging of that does vary depending on where it goes. But direct-to-consumer packaging, it gets built all the way up. Everything gets bled, everything gets adjusted, and the boxes that we use are really large. Essentially, you just have to take a bike out of a box, put the front wheel on, put your seat post in, and you're good to go. And that is pretty much the process. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you guys coming around. Um, I hope this was a valuable tour. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to us and, and Cole and I will help you out. I appreciate it.